uh, so where uh, are you uh very far north of norway uh, wow yeah it's cold what what time is it out there uh midnight it's pretty late yeah how how, how long did you want to go uh, I don't. I don't really know. Probably not longer than half an hour. If I'd have oh, to guess. please! Nobody goes half an hour. We'll we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, so should we just uh, get started? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, okay, great. So, um, I just sort of wanted to start off by getting an idea of how you got into the theory uh, of flat Earth. Sure, sure, sure. I got into flat Earth back in 2014. When I was, for lack of a better term, bored with everything that was conspiracy, I thought I had seen it all and done it all. And everybody that's in the truth or community knows about Flat Earth. Back then, nobody wanted to talk about it. Why in the world would you ever talk about it? It's the only thing we debunk to children. And so I went the other way. It's like, you know what? I'm not getting any younger. Let's give it a shot. And so something that turned... That, that I thought I could nail down in a weekend turned into weeks, which turned into months. And then finally, in the beginning of 2015, I decided to, uh, you know, make the series of videos and, and put it out there and say, okay, I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. So academic, you know, the academic community should be able to shoot this thing down pretty quick. And they never did. And here we are. In fact, uh, February Wow, is that today? It is today, February tenth. It is eight years eight years ago today oh, that I made the uh, they made the clues. So go figure. That's a uh, quite a coincidence, though. Yeah, that is a coincidence. I, I didn't <laughs> it didn't even occur to me. You know, it's it's not a huge anniversary, but yeah, it was it was eight years ago today. Well, that's lucky then. Aren't you then. lucky <laughs> that you did this? Uh, by the way, are you doing this for a school thing or is this a? Uh, uh, I forgot your your original email. Yeah, that's uh, fine. It's uh, it is a school thing. Yeah. So, what what school are you going to be presenting this to? I am curious. Ah, uh, Senor Vidor Gwenda School. You probably, I'm sure you haven't heard of it. It's just a is it is that school. a is that a, a university in in Norway near no, it's, Norway? Uh, the equivalent of high school. So high school. I yeah. can't tell. Everybody looks so young to me. <laughs> it's like all right. So you're 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 in high school in Norway. Yeah, last right. year. Right on. Yeah. Cool. Good for you. Uh, All right. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, here you go. February tenth. This is the eight-year anniversary of Flatter to Clues for anyone who's listening. So lucky you. I am very lucky. That'll be good for uh, editing in. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe I forgot today was the day. I was like, wow, that's weird. People. Anyway, so what else? What else you got? Uh, so. I just wondered if you could start off by, or you started off already, but just describing the model sort of basically for me. Sure. The model, and I can make it even simpler for you, the model looks something like that, which is uh, you're not living on a ball flying through space uh, in multiple different directions, uh, covered by a little bit of water and a little bit of atmosphere. You are living in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling looks kind of like a snow globe only this one you know it's kind of stretched out so it's not as high arched uh and we our best and brightest didn't even figure it out until almost 1960 and when they did the decision was made to keep it a secret for as long as possible we didn't build it we didn't we didn't have anything to do with this thing uh we we just live inside it and uh, whoever built it remains a secret, and uh, the governments at the very, very highest levels uh, of certain governments, and starting with the United States and the Soviet Union, decide to keep it a secret for as long as possible. So, there you go. That's very interesting. Though. That's what so... it looks like. Oh, yeah, and by the way, you know, the, the little details of this inside, so if you look inside, uh, the North Pole is the center. Yes. And uh, the continents are, are spread out along the outside. And the only continent that doesn't look like it should is Antarctica. Uh, you know, Antarctica should be a snow covered island continent that looks similar to. Um, uh, why is my phone blowing up for no apparent reason? Um, uh, it should look like a snow covered version of Australia. 
right? But it's not. In this, it's wrapped around the outside, and it's way, way, way larger. And by the way, a little interesting, it's like if you're wondering where you've seen this before, this is the basically the same layout as the UN flag. Oh, yeah. If you type if you type the UN flag into Google and click on images, that's the map we use. But what's interesting about that map is there's something missing from it. You know what's missing from it? Antarctica. This giant continent, and you're not going to include it in the world UN flag. Instead, it's this spiky wreath that goes around the outside, similar to the to the uh, Antarctic snowy covered mass that we have in our our model. Uh, that is interesting. I haven't yeah. heard that before. Yeah, yeah. It's true. I, I, I'm i full of all sorts of interesting aesthetic trivia. So you'll get a whole bunch of it from me. Uh, so just uh, going back to something you said earlier, you said mm -hmm. that they f you figured it out or that they figured it out in the 60s? Well, about just... eh, late, late 50s, 1960. So the official mission that would have been the closest to figuring out would have been Operation Deep Freeze from 1955 to 1956. That's the big one uh, by Admiral Byrd, Richard Byrd of the United States Navy, youngest admiral ever in the history of the United States Navy. And Operation Deep Freeze was basically what you think it is, which is just another, another mission because he spent most of his life flying around Antarctica. He flew his own missions. And after that one, that's when they started putting in the Antarctic Treaty, which is the only unbroken treaty in the history of world treaties, uh, which says that no corporation uh, from any country, it doesn't matter. Good Lord, why, am I, why is my phone blowing up? Um, <laughs> my phone doesn't ring that much. Uh, when, when that treaty was put in effect, it says no corporation from any country no matter how much money you have uh can set up shop in antarctica ever forever and it's this is one of the weirdest treaties ever it's like uh it says that doesn't matter you know you could own a, a massive uh, oil and gas company with huge amounts of liquid resources right you are not allowed to set up shop. it's the only it's the only as you know where you live right now every square inch of where you are is owned by someone right there's, is there no, there's no land sitting out there that's unclaimed, with the exception of Antarctica. Antarctica is owned by no one. And it's fascinating to me that that, uh, that, that could, should still be the case. In fact, it's not even up for review until 2041. And then you're saying, well, 2041 isn't that far, well, you know, far from now. No, not from now, but it was back in 1960. You know, 1960, it's like, oh, yeah, wait, wait, we're not even going to review this treaty for 80 years. It's like, what? What are you talking about? Why would you ever do that? So yeah, that was one of the the big the big turning points for me was the Antarctic Treaty. That is very interesting. So yeah. is that signed by everyone or yep? Every country that comes on board as an economic power, probably Norway too, uh has to sign. And you can you it's not a secret treaty. You can you can go on and get a PDF copy from online anytime you want. Just type in Antarctic Treaty PDF, you can download one. Um, but when you come on as an economic power, you are forced to sign that. And it says, you. by the way, you have to agree that you will follow the rules of Antarctica. It's like, what are the rules of Antarctica? So, yeah, you, well, you can't really go there really much for anything. You can, as a tourist, you can spend a lot of euros to go down there. I think it's uh, upwards of around 10,000 euros to get to do a tour. Yeah, it's the most expensive tourist destination ever, you know, without it's like almost no lodging you get to go down there and have your picture taken with a few penguins and that's it you do not get to like roam free it's not like you're going to get a, a snowmobile and a helicopter and say oh yeah i just have fun in the snow you, they will never let you do that for a very very good reason and by the way why would you never let i mean come on oil and gas companies can go anywhere they want we all know that they just bribe their way into anything they're not even allowed to talk about it down there I mean, they could, you could start fracking, you know, my neighbor's house and, you know, next week if you're an oil and gas company. But that same company is not even allowed to run an article in a newspaper that says how great it would be to start grabbing oil and gas from Antarctica. It goes against everything that we are as, as capitalists, right? Re greed and money and power rule the world. But these same companies are absolutely handcuffed. They cannot, they cannot do what they normally would do. It's like, what, what conspiracy out there is bigger than money? That's one of them.
the edge of the earth. Yeah, that'd be a big one. Because the think of it, if you're an oil and gas company, eventually you're going to send planes this way and planes that way. And eventually one of those planes is going to go off course, right? This is going to happen. They're going to get lost. And then what? Well, you're going to clean that up, if you know what I mean. You got you to tie off that loose end. Well, how many of those loose ends can you do before people start getting suspicious? So eventually somebody, some part of the Illuminati or whatever can, big group you want to talk says, yeah, let's just, it's not worth it. Just shut down Antarctica. Just lock it down. Just put, put a big chain link fence around it and steal it off. So that's what they did. That is quite uh, compelling, actually. You didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. I've not heard yeah. of that before. Dude, I've been doing this for, well, again, as of today, I've been doing this eight years. This is absolutely real. You where you think you live right now is not where you where where you live. Space is an utter illusion. Everything that you see in the sky is just part of a giant ornamental clock that predates language. That's all it is. You are living in a planetarium, a, a Hollywood sound stage that's massive. It's absolutely massive. That was built by someone that was bigger than us. Um, I know you're. you're I mean, the Truman Show hell is older than you are. If you've never seen the Truman Show movie, watch it if you get a chance because it's a fantastic representation of what you can do. The, tr the Truman Show was said that, oh, you know, if you build like a 20-mile-wide dome, right, in this case it was in Los Angeles, you can fool people into where they live because they're living in a dome. They don't know they're living in a dome. The, the, the quote from that movie, which I, I find so interesting, is uh, we believe the world that is presented to us. Uh, which is true. You know, most of uh, the people that you know, we believe authority. Uh, you know, I talked to, if, here's a great example for you. I know I ramble, so please cut me off. I know you're staring at me like, my God, the man's insane. No. But, but think about this. When I'm, when I, I, I did a, a festival over in uh, Stockholm a couple of years ago. And I was always curious whenever I go outside the United States, inside the United States, I, like, did the Americans go to the moon, right? Because we're the only ones that went, right? Did the Americans go to the moon? Inside the United States, oh yeah, wave the flag, we're the greatest, of course. We went to the moon and nobody else went. But when I talk to people outside of the United States, I say, why do you think the Americans went to the moon? And they all say the same thing. It's like, well, because it was on television. And the American news wouldn't lie about anything. And, and then I kind of stare at them and blink a few times and be like, uh, what are you, serious? <laughs> we're Americans. We lie about everything. All the time. We've lied about every major conflict we've ever been in because we want to be the good guys. We want to, as you know, our image. We want to be that shiny white hat group out there. It's like, we're the heroes. Everybody else is the villains. And if you're not, if, if, if you're not the villains, then we're rescuing you from the villains. You know, Russia's obviously the bad guys. China could be the bad guys. Norway, not so much. Norway's, Norway's an ally. Finland and Sweden, we're working on them. Remember, we're trying to get them to the cool kids club. That whole thing. Yes. Anyway. Uh, so, oh, you said earlier that they'd found it out in the 60s. I was just wondering if you had any theories how they found it out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, think about this. If you're flying, the mission started around... Admiral Byrd went to the North Pole in 1926. Right. The first guy to, to to really do anything, fly fly to the North Pole and back. Whatever they found there, whatever they found in the center of this map, freaked them out so badly. Imagine this. Imagine you have the old maps, right? The you know ancient maps that show what the world looks like. Well, until you have a, you know solid enough technology, you're never going to be able to prove this, right? You know you have wooden ships, you have horses. What are you going to do with that? For hundreds and hundreds of years, that's all you have until you get the internal combustion engine, right? You don't have planes. And as soon as we had planes in the 20s, we, you know, decent planes, we started flying to the North Pole. And then he, they immediately, from 1928 on, sent him to Antarctica. And he just flew round and round and round looking for <laughs> – the media will say whatever he wants. He was looking for the outer marker on this. But it was huge. It was way, way further than they thought it would be. Thousands of miles. They had to set up refueling stations. Did they announce it when they found it? No, of course not. No, but if you found the outer marker, right? If you all of a sudden found out, it's like, oh, by the way, that's the edge of the snow globe we're living in. Do you tell the general public? No, no, you can't. 
You can't. It's it's too late. By 1960, civilization had already been established. All the infrastructure has already been set up. The academia has already been set up. You're just thinking, well, why wouldn't you tell the people? Piers Morgan asked me that question. It's like, why wouldn't you tell people? I go, well, for one, uh, academia would be completely upended, turned upside down, which is you're telling every university in every country, and there are a lot of them, to empty out huge sections of their libraries. Then think about it. Astronomy and astrophysics destroyed for the longest time. You don't even know if they're going to recover. And then the remaining physical sciences, biology, hydrology, archaeology, so on and so on. Anything with anology has to be completely retooled from the ground up, right? That's just academia. Economics, you'd have to suspend world markets for months, if not years, because you don't know what it means. And then a religious, the religious aspect of it, you're, you're giving the five major religious houses of the world, right? Um, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, you're giving them leverage against science simultaneously. Uh, science couldn't recover from that. <laughs> Religion would just go to science and say, so you were wrong about something really important. What else were you wrong about? Let's look into that, shall we? Oh, I don't know. The Big Bang Theory, evolution, carbon dating, dark matter, the Loch Ness Monster. Everything you could possibly think of. Science would be, I, I don't even know what science would do. There aren't enough science scientists out there to do the damage control. So that's what we're talking about here. You know, we, when they figured this out, when when you got to the edge and found, even if you could just see the outer marker, not even touch it, you were in trouble because you can't tell the public. Don't forget, by the way, and I, I, I know I'm kind of dating myself when I say this. Don't forget that just 13 years earlier was the whole Roswell thing. You heard about that, right? You know, the spaceship that supposedly crashed in the desert in the United States. That was 13 years earlier. And the general, the, 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 the base commander called up the press. It's like, yeah, I found myself a flying saucer. I'm going to be a hero, right? People were losing their minds. And this was before television. So it was, oh, I, I don't, the short version is I wouldn't have told anyone either. Not 1960. They weren't ready. Not even close. Now, now you can spin everything to smartphones. You can spin the same narrative out to everyone in the world in less than 30 minutes. And everyone would be on pretty much the same page, whatever narrative it is you want to do. But it's not going to be that. Not yet. Yes, that's very interesting. Sorry. Uh... All right. My camera's gonna die soon, so I might have disappear. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I mean, we, you can do audio only from your side, right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Very sorry about that. No, 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 I don't mind. Uh, yes. So on to the next talking point that I've got. I've only got a few, so I hope that's okay. That's fine. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain weather systems at all. How you understand that to work? If not, weather fine. systems uh you mean on this model yeah oh this model i have some wonderful things i could show you i don't have the graphics in front of me but um there's an app out there that we have called the flat earth sun moon and zodiac clock app yes, which I've, shows the, actually, the what i think i've got that app actually. oh perfect uh, there, there's a there's a weather app on there you know a weather thing that shows that everything in the flat earth model just just follows this big circle this, these you know interlocking circles that are that are that are um, going through the outside of this model, uh, whereas the globe it goes up and down and up and down. So it doesn't, as far as the weather goes, weather works just fine on a flat Earth model. Uh, as far as you know the the underwater conveyor system and the jet stream up above, and you know even the heat transfer with the magma system, no problem at all with the flat Earth model. In fact, it looks way more efficient. Looks way more elegant. And I'm a big believer in elegant means it's probably right. Yeah. Uh, Occam's razor. There you go. Well done. <clears throat> so um, going into Occam's razor, I watched a little bit of interviews with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that you subscribe to the simulation theory, which is... I do. I do. I, I yeah. understand that because it's well, very likely... Well, why wouldn't it be? And and I'm not quoting Elon Musk. I hate that guy. Um, people keep pumping him up to be like, oh, he's the smartest man ever. It's like, what are you talking about? Yes. He's terrible. Um, but the simulation theory predates him by a long shot. 
Uh, I mean, heck, the movies from the 90s, which I recommend so highly, the the two big ones being The Matrix and uh, even more important one would be the, um, uh, the 13th Floor, which was based on a German film from the 1970s called World on a Wire, which is brilliant if you, if you know German. Uh, and that is based off of a book from the 60s called Simulacron 3 you know, simulacron simulation. I mean, that was like the early, I mean, we were thinking about simulations all the way going back to the sixties, but yes, I, why, why wouldn't this be a simulation? Why? Everything points to it. Yeah. And that also of course falls into the Occam's razor of the chances that we would be the first civilization to create it. And like, you know, we're not in a simulation. It's so small. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, come on. I, I, I don't want to, you know, some of this stuff already, which is if when we started building our own simulations, right, and we started incorporating just naturally the double slit experiment logic into it, right, whereas, you know, in, in simulations we build, whatever you're not looking at, whatever's not in front of you in your visual range is not being rendered completely, if at all, right, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's actually happening in our world. Then, then you have to ask yourself, okay, is our world, you know, is there such a thing as an absolute reality? And I know some people call it a base reality. I don't know, even know if that's even really an accurate term. It's more of a, an absolute, you know, is, is there a, a, a reality, you know, is there a foundation? I suppose that's sort of like base. Is there a foundation reality or reality, which we go back to? I don't think so. I think it's cyclical. I think it's, I think it's this reality, which is 99.9% .9 conflict base followed by a 99.9% .9 un, unlimited, unrestricted base. That's my opinion. That's a very good explanation. Uh, Thanks. I think you have it in ways I obviously can't. Though. Well, I mean, I was in the video game industry for a number of years, and that's what we've been aspiring. There's, there's, there's a number of different twists you could do here, which is the the entertainment industry has been trying to create virtual realities for you know in fact our our movies our fiction uh stories have outpaced our our technological advancements and yeah we can render stuff and we can we can do that but their ultimate goal is to tap right into the cerebral cortex you know tap right into your head but that's a lot tougher to do and a lot there's a lot more liability involved, which is, you know, unless you're talking about a surgical implant, which most medical insurance companies would never touch with a 10 foot pole because of all the risks involved. Um, plus there was a, the creator of um, Dilbert, the comic strip from years ago, he, he was a big fan of uh, Star Trek next generation. And in that, if you, if you know the show at all, there was something called the holodeck, which predates virtual reality by by quite a few years i mean it predates the matrix by 10 years and he said the last invention we'll ever build in, in would would be a holodeck you know a virtual a virtual reality which you could walk into because once that happened civilization would collapse as you know it because no one would want to do anything else yeah. all you'd want to do is make just enough money to pay for the service that funds the virtual reality why why would you do anything else i mean you know first thing would 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 disappear would be like um trips vacation trips why would you go kayaking in another country ever if you could do it virtual reality why would you do anything anywhere when you could do it in virtual reality which was you know what kind of the running jokes of star trek it's like why weren't people constantly lined up to use the holodecks in in star trek it didn't make any sense because you're you're god you're on a deep space mission you got nothing else to do but that would apply to to what we, where we are right now. Anyway, sorry, I ramble. That's okay. Yeah. All the more to go through and put in if uh, anything good comes up. So, good. Feel free to ramble. <laughs> I I have been known to do that. <laughs> uh so I you know obviously for something this big you'd have to have a lot of cover ups. A lot of what? Cover ups, uh, like uh, covering it all up. But potentially. But not if this isn't like the U.S. military's atomic weapons program, where you had huge factories in, in three different parts of the country that were refining uranium and nobody knew anything. And they kept it a secret until we blew up parts of Japan. 
this is different in that less is more meaning as long as you lock down two things right as long as you lock down the outer rim with the antarctic treaty that was easy enough to do and then you lock down the upper edge you know the dome you basically militarize space that's all you really need to do and then the rest of the people you just don't have to tell them anything uh you, you've heard of the term need to know that's a military term, which is, do you have clearance? Is there any reason why we should give you clearance to know everything or know anything about it? Uh, most of the cases, no. You know, 99.9% .9 of the people that work at NASA don't have to know anything. Uh, you know, just let them do their jobs. You know, main high-profile high mainstream scientists don't need to know any of this crap. Uh, the only guys that need to know are at the very, very, very tippy top, and then some of the telemetry guys. You know, the, the, the people that make that that let you know in 3D space where a rocket supposedly is, those guys have to lie. But the rest of them don't. So as far as, you know, tons and tons and tons of people, you know, I love that some people say, oh, you know, every astronomer has to has to know the secret. It's like, no, they don't. Why would you tell them? As long as they don't figure it out on their own, you don't have to. And as far as astronauts go, 99% of them are military officers. So they're under a completely different set of rules anyway. You know, if, if, if you, uh, if you do something wrong, you go breaking law, you may go to court, you might go to jail. If you're in the military, it's called treason. And that's a whole nother thing. You know, they will, you know, lock you in a room and throw away the room if they have to, you know, this, it's not the same rules as, as what we have. They can do you know, firing squads. That's a thing, you know, in the military, they can, they can do anything they want. So it's kind of like uh, they treat them like spies. If, you, if you've ever watched a spy movie, you know, which is, okay, you're a spy. All right, you're going to grab this rifle. You're going to shoot out this hotel room window. And you're going to kill this guy in this limousine over there on this particular day and time, right? You don't get to know why you're killing them. You don't even get to know, you know, anything really about them or the political intrigue about it. You're just there to fire the gun. And then you go home. And then that's it. In fact, this, most of the spies don't want to know. Like, I don't really, really care. I just want to go get my paycheck and do my job, right? Same thing with, with the astronauts that are, that are doing their thing today. It's like, yeah, they know they're faking something, but you don't tell them why they're faking it. In fact, how many, how many of those astronauts actually know what this looks like? Deniability and denial in general is a very, very powerful thing. Uh, I know you're not really old enough to know that yet, but you will, which is until it happens, it hasn't happened. Until you know it for sure, you don't know it for sure. Um, uh, there's an old saying in the marriage world, whenever you decide to get married, which is, uh, your husband isn't cheating on you until you see the pictures. <laughs> and even then, you know, there's a lot of women that's like, no, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. And then you, you show the pictures. It's like, finally, it kicks in. Denial is the most predictable human response ever, followed by anger, followed by bargaining, followed by depression, and then finally followed by acceptance but denial always the first one you've done it yourself something you don't believe what's your immediate reaction it's like no way that can't be that's impossible and that's just wiring in your head yeah i've um i remember it was a while ago but i heard that or i've heard that there's a the chemical response to being proven wrong is the same as physical pain so you have a fight there or you flight go. I thought that was very interesting so yeah crying, yeah yeah crying. and again that's just that's just part of our wiring and it probably saves our lives in a lot of cases yeah. you know you it probably yeah. well one it saves people from being scammed all the time you've heard the saying if it's too good to be true probably is you know probably is too good mm -hmm. so what else you got <laughs> not much actually getting a bit no old. come on throw something at me anything uh so, well, you said earlier that astronomers, you know, they if they figure it out, but I mean, from the way you described it, it sounds like it'd be almost impossible for them to figure it out because. It, well, if they could, well, let, I'll give you a great example. So if you're the government and you want to keep this thing a secret, obviously you, you watch your astronauts very, very closely uh, and you watch the, the NASA guys, you know, anyone that's dealing with telemetry, you watch them closely. Uh, but one of the other groups you want to watch, and there have been some mysterious deaths over the years, you know, people that run high-end radio telescopes and uh, observatories around the world. <laughs> you know, so the term I use there. Um, 
there have been they they do die more often than usual and it's kind of funny it reminds me of the 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 1998 movie um deep impact where in in this case let's say you're a radio telescope guy right and all of a sudden you notice that the sea, the sky the ceiling isn't doesn't make sense you start shooting emails around to different you you know your friends you would monitor that sort of traffic you would you would monitor those guys and if all of a sudden someone had a breakthrough it's like dude if i didn't know any better i'd say we were there was some sort of dome up there well then you figure out what to do one way or the other but either way w w the secret has been you know it's only time and money uh the secret has been kept for long enough that you can you know they've done very very well over the years you know they they've kept this thing really tight you know very 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 few leaks i mean come on there hasn't been a single astronaut that's broken ranks and granted there's only been like 500 astronauts in the history of astronauts but not one of them has had some sort of weird deathbed confession the closest we ever got was the founder of nasa uh you know the the german nazi scientist uh, Werner von braun who on his headstone you can look it up yourself it's not not a secret uh it says you know there's only one thing on his headstone other than you know the name his name and when he was born and when he died uh it is psalm uh, 19 1. i didn't know what that was from you know from the bible it says and the firmament shows his handiwork why would the father of nasa one be quoting the bible at all on his headstone and two be quoting a verse that says that oh yeah by the way the dome up there proves that there's god it's like what <laughs> why would you say that so uh, you know, is he reaching out from the grave i think so <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I am very sorry, but Zoom is cutting me off here. It's uh, oh, we we at the limit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no worries at all. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, if you need anything else, uh, let me know. Yeah. Hopefully, this this helps out with your with your project. Um, I'd love the uh copy of the audio if you get a chance. Yeah. Shoot it, shoot it to me in email or shoot it to me however you want. Uh, um, this meeting. The yes, would love yes, it. Of course, I can send that. Uh, okay. Just before you go, I would like to thank you, obviously, because you've helped me with this a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have to say, you know, uh, I had one other interview for this. I had another one that was supposed to happen, but it didn't with uh, David Weiss. I'm sure you've heard from him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it didn't work out, unfortunately. He oh, no. Had issues. So uh, you are the uh, replacement. Sorry. I'm the guy. Oh, thank you. By the way, I'll have to mention that to David. It's like, oh yeah. By the way, I got your leftover interview. <laughs> nice. But yeah, uh, I I really appreciate you standing up. And I must say, you know, I've had one other interview and that was with a guy called Professor David Explains. I don't know. If oh yeah, don't don't get me started with that guy. You you've been a lot nicer than him. Honestly, he was very aggressive. Yeah, he's he's an awful person. I, as far as trolls go. Even though I'd love him to get hit by a bus, uh, if he did go, we'd we'd have one less troll, and uh, he wouldn't we wouldn't generate as many metrics. So he's he's a necessary. I don't say this often. He's a necessary evil. So, but thank you. Yes, but uh, anyway, thank you very much again. Uh, All right. You well, if you need lot, if you so... need anything else, or if you need any resources, just drop me a line, and I'll I'll see what I can do. Thank you very much. That's very kind. All right. Have a good one. Have you a good too. night. A good night. Right. Bye. Bye. Hello, Daisy. Hello, Maggie.